Whether you're trying to grow a beauty salon, a cafe or any other retail business, there are some marketing fundamentals you need in place. Nothing complicated, just some good old-fashioned principles that every successful business owner understands. And who better to remind us what they are than Lisa Conway, an ex-hairdresser. Hey, before we immerse ourselves in episode 386 of the Small Business Big Marketing Show, the marketing gold is made possible thanks to American Express and Design Crowd. Design Crowd is the world's number one custom design marketplace where with access to 550,000 designers, you'll get the perfect design every time. Get $100 off at designcrowd.com forward slash Timbo. And check this out. You've got to love it when your business expenses reward you. When you apply for an American Express Business Explorer credit card by November 30 and spend $3,000 in the first three months from the card approval date, you'll receive a bonus 100,000 membership reward points. Search Amex Business to find out how. New American Express card members only. Terms and conditions apply. (laughs) I always wanted to do that. I said, welcome to a small business marketing show Where successful small business owners share their souls To take your marketing straight to the lead Now, here's your host, Mr. Tim Bowie And welcome back to the Small Business Big Marketing Show The number one marketing podcast in Australia As ranked by the Apple iTunes Store Which is also available on all Virgin Australia flights I'm your host, Timbo Reed, but you, so much more importantly, you're a motivated business owner ready to crank out some great marketing to build that beautiful business of yours into the empire it deserves to be. Big show today. Ex-hairdresser, now straight-talking business coach, Lisa Conway, reminds us just how simple building a successful business should be. I'll show you how to get your customers coming back for more by being extremely efficient And we go back into the vault, revisiting one of my most shared episodes of recent times. As per usual, team, there is marketing G-O-L-D dripping from the ceiling over here at Small Business Big Marketing's HQ. So let's get stuck right in. Coming up after today's interview, I'll give you a simple hack to ensure your clients choose you every single time. But right now, let's go and meet today's successful business owner who has a refreshingly no-nonsense approach to business and marketing. She also drops the S-bomb, not the F-bomb, the S-bomb a few times. So it might be good to get the Play-Doh out now for the kids. Know what I mean? Got it out? Okay. Okay. Good. Lisa Conway discovered her passion for hair and beauty when she was 18. Over the next couple of decades, she built a hugely successful salon business whilst others floundered in a highly competitive marketplace. She's no longer cutting hair, but is instead one of Australia's leading business coaches to those that do. Her dream is for every salon and spa owner to make a great living by building a business they love. She's published three books on the topic, authored countless articles, speaks regularly at industry events, and has helped hundreds of salon owners change the way they do business, lead teams, and manage their time and money. I started off by asking Lisa, what's the worst hair trend she's ever seen? Worst trend, oh Lord. Ooh, I think the mullet, that was really bad. Yeah. Wasn't a good one, was it? No, it wasn't good for anybody, the mullet. I don't think it made anyone look any better. No. <laughs> did you ever, I think you it ever just, had one? It, no, no, no. I did a few. Yeah, I did a few. And then I hated the flat top. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sort of like the... Like, hey. you know, it just attracted the very OCD kind of... Oh, did it? ...pain yeah, in the like, ass. Yeah, get the ruler out. Yeah. The rest would be shit, but my hair's sharp. <laughs> yeah, right. You Love know? it. You, you grew up in a country town, Lisa. You would have done a yeah. few mullets. At the age of 18, you get into hairdressing. That was a fairly obvious career transition from um, a, uh, a girl in a country town. No, not really. I 
I left the country and because I wanted to be a hairdresser. So what happened to me, I walked into Collins Street, uh, Elizabeth Street, and looking Ooh. for a haircut. I don't know. I thought I'd get a haircut. Hadn't thought anything of it. And the way they treated me just changed my life. Right there and then I decided that's it. I want to be a hairdresser now because she was just gorgeous. This girl really cared about me. And I just thought, wow, imagine doing that for a living. Imagine helping people. And that was it. I went home. I was working in aged care and I went home and chucked my job in and came back to Melbourne and became a hairdresser. Just to be clear, at the age of 18... 19, I 19, was. 19, mm. you had that realisation. Boom. Mate, that is fed. That's That's what I call an epiphany. It was a huge one. Yeah, and I you, couldn't stop looking at myself in the mirror all the way home, thinking, "Oh, I'm actually, I'm all right." <laughs> was this was this Elizabeth Street hairdresser operating off a low base, or? Uh, well, I think it was a training school. <laughs> Shot. I, was, I just took me a while to get that. You know, of a man. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was. I just, I couldn't believe. I'd never experienced that before. I was just told I had ordinary hair because it is wild, and no one gave a shit. Basically. So. so Here's our first lesson, I reckon, mm. is the pitch because there'd be many business owners listening, salon owners and everyone else. Mm. You know, if someone says to a hairdresser, what do you do? They say, I'm a hairdresser, I cut hair. Mm. No, you don't. No, you don't. No, no. What's your response to that? Oh, you just, you know, people come in at a number, it might be a two or a four, and you raise the bar. Send them out, I used to send them out ten, ten out of ten, spinning around and happy. <laughs> you make people feel like a ten make out people, of ten. Yeah, make people feel good. It's an incredible job. It's a great pitch. Oh, it's a great job. And people don't get it. We can't get people to join our industry. Really? really oh, it's terrible. I, I thought it was a highly competitive industry, no, oversupplied. No, no, There's a no. hairdresser on every corner. Yeah, I know, but they still can't find staff and they're working uh, in ones and twos. In in my day, in 1984... Back they, in my day. Like in my day, they used to be groups of 10s and 12s and 15s. It was buzzing. It was like the cafe culture now used to be hairdressing. It's a uh, ongoing problem, no matter what type of industry the small business owner is in. It's what's your biggest problem? People. People attracting, and retaining people. Yeah, because they're not leaders. So what we're going to talk about, I'm going to guess, will help any business owner mm. uh, achieve the attraction and retention of great people. So you go back, you go, Mum, I'm a ten out of ten now. Have a look at me. <laughs> um, I'm leaving aged care. I'm getting into hairdressing. So for how many years did you cut hair before you started your own business? Uh, 16. 16. Yeah, I worked for one man. Wow. Yeah, he was a ripper, paid me really well, let me run the place and he was just awesome. And I didn't realise why why he loved me. I was a ripper of a team <laughs> member. It wasn't until I started finding my own that I thought, oh, no wonder Sam loved me. What, what, what was he particularly... So Pager Well gave you enough rope to hang yourself by the sounds of it. Well, flexibility. I was, I think I was age 21 and I said, I can't do five days a week. That's too hard. You've got to put your face on and be switched on. What if I did four? He said, do four and do the same money, you can do four. I did four. And that's what people aren't flexible today, you know. I, I gave my managers Saturdays off because you want them to have something that no one else has. You've got to be attractive. Mm -hmm. And so Sam worked that out early in the piece and I just stayed. I had children, I had three kids um, when I worked for Sam and it wasn't until I wanted to work a bit more because I I had uh, my daughter and went back four weeks later on a Saturday, took the breast pump to work with That's me. That's it? Loved it. <laughs> Like, you know, why wouldn't you put your Pumping heels on? Pumping and cutting or yeah, you did one, no. one or no, the I other? No, I do. Well, there was a day when someone nearly drank it in the fridge when I left it there. That We had to put labels <laughs> on things. But um, Sam was just like that. He just, you know, you perform and do a good job and he accommodated you and that's what a good boss there's does. Something, uh, it's, a, it's a wanky word, but there's something very authentic about that, you know, and being able to bring the breast pub. I saw uh, a pink on oh, 60 yes. Minutes. Did you see yeah, that? Yeah, I did. And they were talking about Love that it. photo she shared on Instagram of yeah. some kind of weird... <laughs> well, it sort of stepped it up a notch since I was <laughs> Well, it was, since a, it was, was some feeding. kind of vest that had oh, inbuilt breast pumps. But yeah. point is, listeners, uh, this is not a breast pump. This is not a lactation <laughs> conversation. <laughs> she posted that on Facebook. Because she's you know, real. Real. That's why people love her. She's absolutely real. Tell me about that. You love pink. I can see a bit of pink in you. Yeah, she, you know, I just love the way that she says, well, this is how I am and I'm going to be the best version of me. And I think if we took that leaf as a, you know, as a person, but as a business leader... You know, people want to be with someone who's going somewhere, who's going places and doing things and got a, a thriving, growing business, not come in and these are all the things you're not allowed to do. You know, that's pretty sad, I think. 
You yes, you say you tell it how it is, right? And there, there's probably not enough. That's what attracted me to having this chat with you. I'm expecting some kind of you know, <laughs> don't do this, do that. They're all bloody doing this. They're all idiots. But you know, there's not enough people. I don't think out there who necessarily no, do that. And, and they... I think yeah, I think as you get older, you get better at it. I think that you become comfortable in your skin. Like I'm 53, but I, I was always pretty much a straight shooter, and you like me or you didn't, and I was okay with that. But I think I've didn't find it hard to get people to work for me because I made it really clear as to how good it was going to be here, you know, and what you might find here. And especially um, women, like to have a nest of women and, and have no bitchiness, that's pretty cool if you can do that. Pretty hard. Yeah, it is hard, but I just make the rules, you know. Just I think lost, I've just lost half, lost half my listening audience <laughs> yeah, by saying whoops. that. Whoops. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think one of my friends, Bruce, said to me years ago... Said, Bruce, you know, is he a hairdresser? No, oh, no really? hair, no hair. He said, you know what I like about you? You think like a man. I said, oh, Bruce, I don't think you can say that out loud. He said, you just do. It's not overcomplicated. And I think, you know, there's feminine energy and masculine energy, but I think we get caught up into the motion of everything when if you just put emotion aside... And then make a really good decision. And it's the same with divorce, you know. If you can put emotion aside. Like I've had friends who've who've taken three dining room chairs and he's got three. What are you going to do with three? <laughs> Who's, who comes Far in three? I know. At least four and two. <laughs> Correct. Your dining room do, chairs. Exactly. They sell more. Yeah. What are you really fighting over here? Yeah, Okay. Okay, so Lisa, you are sixteen years working for the man, for Sam, yep. for working for Sam. You love mm. him. You've learned yep. a lot from him. Did you know at the time that you were just building this treasure chest of business knowledge in order to one day start your own? No, not at all. No, I decided I didn't want to drive anymore because I was in Gisborne. And I did a forty-five minute drive down to Melbourne, so if I, I wasn't going to do that every day, that's just too hard. So um, the GST was coming in, and there was people folding who had hair salons who thought, well, now I'm going to have to count money for the government, I can't do this. And so there's a bit of a clearing sale. And I looked in this um, shop that had closed down that was a salon and when I looked in there, someone looked back and went, can I help you? I thought, oh, that one's been taken. And then he said, up the road there's a couple of empty ones. So I, my intention was to have a salon of just one. I thought, no, nah, I'm over it, you know. Sorting out all the things that Sam couldn't be bothered to sort out and, you know, customer care was slipping and he'd really couldn't care anymore. And so I just wanted to work on my own. And then I thought if the kids can come after school, we're good. So I put the, the salon wall halfway in the salon because there's a lot of back room. And we pulled that out and moved it right down to the back 12 months later because it just took off. People wanted to come to me and, and I, I suppose I had real good city hairdressing skills yes. and I had this really good country, make you feel good, yes, come in attitude. Found that, that was your intersection. Yeah, and that was just what I did, you know. Hmm. So I um, put someone on. I started in the first of the first of the first and Jeez, you want to talk OCD? I yeah, mean, you it was that? an accident, no. <laughs> and uh, I think my rent was 170 bucks. $111? A week, yeah, $111. <laughs> Not good with numbers, so we've got to make it easy. Yeah. And I just put on a team member and another one and another one. And then I, I had it for nine years and I started and uh, finished nine apprentices in nine years, which is unheard of. People find it really hard to train people today. I didn't. I just treated them like kids. Behave yourself or I'll give you a whack over the ear. <laughs> and um, it just took off and you, I loved it. You make that, that rolled off your tongue then. Business ain't that easy. Well, it was for me. And I think when I look back now, and I that was my, I had a second business in the city. It wasn't as easy. No, it what wasn't. What was that? Tattoo parlour? No. <laughs> Brothel. No, it wasn't. It was a salon. <laughs> another salon? A, another salon, yeah. And I didn't work in that one. So it was, it was harder to get it off the ground when you weren't there all the time. So that's interesting. Now we've got a benchmark. We've got mm. enough. We can we can do a split test here. Mm. So you got two salons. At yep. the, you opened at the no, same time. No, I because um, I was leaving the country to come and live in the city, so I sold the country one and bought a city one. Okay. Mm. So the, the successful ones in the city. In the country. Oh, geez, mate. Easier Much easier. In the country. Because Much. everyone knows your business. So yeah, right. It's, you don't even have to market yourself. So, so the fact that you weren't there in the led city to one, yeah. a de- that doesn't bring a lot of hope, does it? Because well, all of I a think sudden you, it no, becomes but you gotta, person dependent. No, because you've got to get in there and get started. Uh-huh. Yeah, and then once you do, then you can step back a bit. 
but you you need to get in and make sure it's all done. I was already coaching other salons at that stage, and look, it was good. We we bought they advertised it for thirty thousand this salon, and I told him he could have ten. And then he was a smart ass. I said, you know, you can have six for your computer because that's all it was worth. It wasn't worth anything. I think there was shonky business going on before we took it over. As in, there was a lot of muscle men came in. Something was really oh, yes, suspicious there. Yeah, and um, so I built it up and we sold it for good money uh, two years later. So it, well, it wasn't a flop, but it was. Wasn't like the heart and soul of the one that I was the centre of, and then worked my way off. So it was kind of different. You are working in the one in the country, and so I worked they... my way off the floor. Though I stopped working on the floor probably about three years before I sold it. So well, I just ran it with my mouth. Okay, okay. So what you what you mean by that is you weren't on the tools no. for the last three years. Last three years, I wasn't on the tools. Were you in there doing things? No, no. Didn't need to be. Had reception. Had okay. Yeah. So All it right. run by itself. So I, I want to find out what you did and what other business owners can do, both in salon land, retail land generally. Yep. But first, it is a fascinating industry and I want to find out because I'm guessing, and you're a coach now to hairdressers and salon mm-hmm. owners, there's a lot of them doing a lot wrong and there's a lot we, in, our, in our little chat the other week. We walk past, I mean, I walk past some salons and the fit out, it's like a five-star restaurant and you just can't <laughs> help but you then immediately make the, mm. oh, they must be making a million bucks. Jeez, they're doing well. You're telling me they're not. No, quite often they're not. They, it, it's a real surprise because when we start to work with a salon or even when we pitch to work for the salon, what we do is we want to see their, I call their traffic. So I want to see how many people come in, what do they spend, you know, how often they repeat your average dollar sale. And sometimes you go to these little shonky vills and you go, whew, good on you. Smashing you know, it. Smashing it. Well done. And then you go to some and you think, hmm, this is, I'm very yeah, impressed yeah. that they even want me to look, you know, thinking it's a bit hoity toity. And you think, what the hell's going down here? So I call them peacocks, those ones. <laughs> they're, they're very colourful at the front and blah, blah, blah. And then they turn around, the bank account's all brown. And and they'll even argue with you. I say, you know, little things that you can do, like you could write on the, the mirror um, a promotion or something. No, not writing on my mirror. Why? It doesn't look good. I said, well, your, bra- your bank account looks worse. <laughs> but they, they, they sort of can't. They're very visual and and that's really uncomfortable. So, yeah, you've got to break that thinking that it's not an image, you know. <sighs> A few weeks ago in this chair we had Chris Lucas who owns uh, some of the most amazing restaurants in Melbourne, Chin Chin, Hawker's Hall, uh, Baby Kong Pizza, all those. Um, he And I asked him a similar question which was there's no shortage of restaurants and there seems to be a restaurant in every corner mm. and m- most can't be making a dollar. And he said, you, you know, you're right, some are just lifestyle businesses, some are happy to mm. earn a, you know, a wage. Um, his view was that Me Too doesn't intellectually interest him. He needs mm. to create something that's special that no one's done before. Yep. Do you agree with that? Or no, you... Absolutely. You've got to have a niche because if, you know, I, I say to people all the time when I'm working with them, why should I come have my hair cut with you? And I say, because we're friendly and we're really nice. And I go, oh, no. oh sorry. <laughs> Aren't we all? And anyway, that's a matter of opinion. Yeah. You know, so what do you do? And look at the barbers. We nearly lost the barbers altogether. They almost disappeared and now they've popped up and you, you go past them on a Sunday, they're full of staff, they're, they're full amazing. of clients. Yeah, exactly, because they're a niche and they're working it out and that's that's the secret. So colouring niches or cutting only. And there's a chap here in Fitzroy, only cuts curly hair. That's it. No. They, yep, they come from all over Australia. Is, it, got is it called curlies? No, it's called Neil Loves Curls. That's unreal. Mm, he's like a 135 or something like that for a haircut. And they <laughs> travel everywhere. He's just a machine. He just loves curls. He, you know, trained himself all over the world and he's just fantastic. Is your advice then, uh, I had niche down here, I think it's a fascinating yeah. discussion because niches yeah. are scary. When people niche, they think they're going to polarise everyone mm. else, which I'm not sure. I mean, Neil would because you ain't got curly hair, you're not going to Neil, but... Yeah, but he, his audience is far and wide and so what he does is he works with a person who can't find that care anywhere else. Like even my curly hair, people who'd come to me from other hairdressers would say, go and see Lisa. And I'd say, where'd you come from? And they say, oh, the salon across the road sent me in. <laughs> 
because I don't know how to cut curly hair and they're not interested. And because I have a, a head of curly hair, I was interested. So it, it can be that, can be blow waving. You know, we've got blow wave bars now. Um, so, yeah, or colouring. People specialise in colouring. So that's the secret. And, you know, someone told me years ago, uh, a niche is an inch wide, right? But it's a mile, mile deep. Mile deep. And that is so true. Look at me. It's all I work with, hair and beauty salons. Yeah, I love it. I, yeah, I, it's I, just, I, it's, I, and, and to me, I can be so good at it because that's all I'm focused on. You know, I have people come to me who want me to coach them. I've got one at the moment. She's a, um, a physio for dogs. And she sent me this lovely email and I sent back, no, you know, you're not hair and beauty. And she, yeah, ca- right. and she came back again and said, but you know what, actually, I think you're wrong, blah, blah. And I said, all right, I'll talk to you. Because she's really keen. And I don't I don't mind helping someone who's feisty and, yep. you know, someone like that. So, you know, with, whether I do or not, I've helped the odd personal trainer. But I just think I love the hairy people, you know. I love them because they're my people. I, I made all the mistakes they made as well. So, so we in, get it. In, in that inch wide niche, and just to be clear, are you suggesting that like a tip for a, a salon or any, any type of business is consider owning a niche? Mm. Yeah. Okay. Do what you love. Okay. So within that, a niche has its own language. So that's great. You yep. can speak, you, you speak yep. the same language. Um, there is, it's easy for others to refer you mm-hmm. because if you're the chick who cuts curly hair and that's all... And they don't want to cut it, so they send it to you. Send it to you. Okay. Yeah. Neil sends all these colours down the road um, and I've got salons that I work with now and they send them all to Neil. Send them to Neil. Mm-hmm. Because they want, you know, a genuine um, person who cares about another person wants them to get the right thing, so send them there. How Do, do you have a process for identifying your niche? Well, I think it's pretty easy because it's what you love. You know, people do what they're good at. And so they get better and better at it. But say, for example, you've got kids coming in and well, they all hate kids, so they just price them out. You know, but there's people who even do niches for kids. And we came across a salon the other day um, in Sydney and she's niched her salon. She's just started and she's fitted it all out for the disabled. She's even got a hoist to lift them out of their wheelchairs and into the basin. And that's her thing? That's her thing. Wow. Mm, awesome. People Desiree's are going to travel name. from everywhere. Well, that's right. And so she's she's only just starting to, you know, break even and we want to help her with that because her audience is going to be an organisation so people will bring them to. So she's got a special room, doesn't look at all like a salon for kids with autism. Amazing. What if you... Okay, so you, to choose a niche, you choose something you love. What if your love isn't a profitable thing? Um... Well, you might say that about someone who's going to work with a disability too, but I think you can make it a profitable thing. You know, so I think anything that you do should be profitable. It's like blow waves. You know, there's blow wave salons and some of them aren't profitable because they're just blow waving. But others that do it fast, you know, who who work, um, you know, on a rebooking system and, and have packages and that, then it can work. So oh, I don't know. I just think if you really love what you do, then you'll find a way to make it work. You've just got to think wider. And most people, like even in my business, I only coach salons that I could drive to. Well, that wasn't going to work forever, was it? I was going to run out of them. Mm-hmm. So now I coach salons all across Australia. We've had our first account in New Zealand. So, you know, you've got to think bigger. And if you've got a niche, you've got to think bigger. So that's just what happens when you niche. You start to get really smart about it. You get a reputation with it. And then people come from far and wide. So if, you know, if you physically have to touch someone like you do in a salon, then that is a little limiting, I agree. But if you have things like I do, which is education or I just need my voice, you've just got to be able to get to you. You you film a lot of content, you have stuff that you can give to them beforehand. So it works a treat. I just want to, we'll wrap up niche in a minute, but it is a fascinating topic. And uh, so you find something you love, you find a way to make it work. Um, What if there is the hairdresser down, what if my niche, I'm a hairdresser, my niche is colouring Mm -hmm. and the other salon a few doors down is also colouring. Does she go, oh no, I should choose something else or you just do it better than them? Well, you're thinking too small for starters. So let's think about uh, Indian restaurants. Welcome to my world. Yeah. (laughs) Well, think about Indian restaurants. Yes. Well, they're side by side. Yeah, I know. It doesn't make them right. I know, but if you you do an an exceptional job, it will be right. Yes. Okay, so, so stop you're worrying right. about everyone else. Just perfect what you're doing. Geez, you're harsh, mate. I'm almost going to wrap this up. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, I love I, it. <laughs> I do. I get a bit excited. Like, the Good. world's full of can't-do people. Yes. What the hell? Yes. It just drives me insane. I'm I had sorry, another fellow a bit in of a nerve chair. there, love. Glenn Azar, he said, we're all, getting, we're all trying to get to mm. death safely. 
Yeah. That was his thing. <laughs> Gave you a T-shirt, hashtag not dead yet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Have a crack. Have a crack? Have a crack. And stop telling me how it can't work. If you show up and you want to work with me and you say, oh, I can't find staff, blah, blah, blah. Look, I have two things. I, I have to make sure you're not going to whinge about how good it was in 1984 because I'm not interested. And the other thing is you've got to tell me that what you want and can I help you to do it, not how it's not going to work. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like I, when I hear someone's been married three times, I'm like, good on you, have another crack. Instead of I got married once, mm. not even going, not even having coffee with anyone now. Yeah, right. Well, how's that working for you? Did you diss 1984 before? Because it's one of my favourite years. Oh, is it? Sorry. Yeah. You'd be an 80s chick. I'm going to yeah. digress here, but what about the to... hair in the 80s? Oh, that one. we used to tip our hair upside down, spray it with a tin of lacquer. How do we even get that in our handbags? You used to go to the underground and all the women were upside oh, down in the powder wasn't room. That great. I think, what, like, you know, I remember my brother coming from the country to pick me up out of the academy and I said, Danny, you've got to come. There's at five o'clock, there's, there's 300 women come out. They're all gorgeous, right? Yeah. Anyway, he was a farmer. He came down and he sat in the car. He said, well, I saw 348 that were ugly. I said, what do you mean? He goes, oh, they had that much makeup on their hair was sticking up. <laughs> oh, I said, I forgot Daddy, you like a natural on, girl. You can take the boy out of the country, but you can't take the <laughs> so country out of the boy. Beauty's in the eye of the beholder, clearly. Let's talk, uh, we're going to go around the place here, but let's now sort of um, dissect other parts, other component parts that make for a successful uh, sell-on business. Can I, can I just talk retail? Is that, a, is that Yeah, retail's yeah, my I, thing. I wrote a book on that. What was it called? Your sell on retail. You're clever. Such a ripper. Let's talk pricing. Why are men's oh. hair, hair cuts so much cheaper than women's? When my wife says I'm going to get Because hairdressers hair cut, are silly. Huh? Because hairdressers are silly. <laughs> you reckon, oh, don't you? No, don't you? No, I'm not going to do the equal. No, they don't have a blow wave for starters, right? Yeah. So a woman generally has a cut and a blow wave. You know. Yeah. Well, look, my Simon, I used to cut his hair. I did it about twice. I reckon twice. I've got you here. Hey? I no. I reckon, I've got oh, I reckon got it's, a, it's a scam. No. <laughs> Women will pay more. <laughs> they will. That'll do it. <laughs> you don't want that money no, burning they're pains in, in the your arse. Pocket. Men, are, men aren't pains in the arse. Right. <laughs> so you out. shouldn't have to charge them, especially if you've got big boobs. They're fine. <laughs> Who, the men? No, the women. Oh, the women. The hairdressers. <laughs> then they'll do anything. No, women. I, in Sex the cells. Uber, on the, that's right. In the Uber on the way in, I, the bloke said to me, we asked where I was going or something, so I told him, and he said... In oh, life or just... No, <laughs> no, into here. And he said, oh, I said, I'm doing an interview for blah, blah, blah. And he goes, I work in the hair and beauty space. And he goes, yeah, I don't really go there much. <laughs> so I turned to my right and saw him, and I thought, yeah, you probably don't. No air left. <laughs> Really? He said, oh, I might make a comeback. Love it. So what do you say to pr- – what's your pricing advice to a, a sell-on owner that you're coaching? Well, I think it's got to start, and I say this to everybody, so for every half an hour you've got to charge 45 minutes at least. 45 bucks. $45, sorry, $45 at least, right? And then you go up from there. So that's your base. Otherwise, you're not going to make any money. So how people go in and pay $10 for a haircut, I don't know. There's something dodgy going on there. Yeah, it's fascinating, isn't it? Well, it's not right, and I don't know why we don't shut them down, to be honest. <laughs> but anyway, uh, and so then for years of service, you know, the customer care and, um, you know, all the all the things that you've been trained. Like, oh, I got a haircut. I used to cut hair at High Point for $26 for men, right, when I first started, way back in the 80s. You can still get a haircut there. You can. And that's what the bucks. Uber driver was saying today. He said, when's, when's coffee going to get off $3? He said, how long's coffee been $3.80? He said, I reckon 10 years. I said, I agree. He said, they should be six bucks. Jeez. True. And hairdressing is one of those things that hasn't gone up. Flights were dearer 10 years ago than they are now. Well, the pro- is it price elastic- elasticity of hairdressing is clearly reaching a point where, I mean, most blokes aren't going to pay 50 bucks for a haircut. <gasps> I, well, I'm sorry, but really? Some aren't. We can go we to a barber. No, I know, but I also think they you can go somewhere where they don't give you any advice on how to look after your hair at home, so they don't sell you a product, they don't talk to you about your scalp. Most men go bald because they use too many laurel sulfates in their shampoo, and uh, we, you don't know you about knew that. Yeah, it was the laurels. Yeah, the laurels, they're buggers. Yeah. And so there's so much more advice. But, you know, think of it like this, and this is what I say to sell owners, it's like food. Sometimes I just want a McDonald's, mm-hmm. and other times I want a fine dining with a big glass of wine. So what do you want when you want a haircut? I can't help it if you only want McDonald's. There's salons for you. But if you want to go somewhere where they're actually ahead of the curve, they know what's going on, they treat you beautifully, like the, what a haircut can give you is an unbelievable edge and confidence. 
It is. Yeah, no, agreed with that. So that's the same as fine dining. Some people don't care that there's little rose petals on the side of your dish. They mm-hmm. go, what am I going to do, eat them? No. <laughs> Right? Clearly. I've got five brothers. They come down from the country and they said, why do they put all this shit in the food? Sorry if I said that word. But I, You've I, said it three times oh, prior sorry. to that, so don't it's worry. okay. We could. And so I just think, oh, Gary, why, do, why wouldn't you want it? Yeah. Like he just wants a pie and chips. Let's talk customer experience because I'm going to guess that's pretty close to your heart. Um, uh, there is a barber shop that I've been to and I haven't made it a habit of going there and now I'm wondering why because the experience they offer is fantastic and they do charge about 50 bucks for a haircut but you walk in uh, it's an open bar you can yep. have everything from a jack daniels and coke through to a cheap beer yep. uh, it's part of the deal you don't yep. pay for that um you know all the blokes have got tats they're all looking like this yep. hipster thing um there's very really cool posters there's barbers it's just a it is a total immersive experience and it's ace and it's all blokes and we're all talking crap and it's just a lot of fun mm. so i get that niche they're charging mm. what they deserve yeah um, oh, no, it's good experience so customer experience how, how do you mm. get a hairdresser who goes what are you talking about i don't even know what marketing is much less customers mm. how do you get them to buy into that concept well i think for starters the first problem is that they don't ever buy what they sell so I call them vegetarians that work in butcher shops. It's all wrong, isn't it? It's all wrong. So if you don't ever buy what you sell, how would you know what it feels like? So most of them have been in the industry since they left school. They've never even been out and had an experience. They've never, And then I, I get them to go and have it and they go, oh, I couldn't go. What if they muck it up? I go, well, how? hello, now you know what the customer feels like. So the good salon owners will be going out all the time and having their hair done. And they'll pick up on tips here and there and they know what's going on. They go, oh, that was really cool. I like the way they did this or I like the way they did... They're too... They're hidden. They're, you know, they're, they've got no idea what's going on. So that's really sad. So that's very hard for them to give that experience if they don't know. And then you've got some in the salon, probably one, the owner, who does give an exceptional experience, but the others don't. So that was kind of my problem. I had people who wanted me and it was the Lisa Sparkle that they wanted. It wasn't necessarily the haircut. So I had to work on a way that I could teach other people to be so engaging. So I'd be cutting hair and someone's coming to the door with the pram and I leave my client to open the door for the lady with the pram when the hairdressers are standing there. What the hell? That's a customer experience too. You know, nothing. Sam taught me, short of prostitution, everything's possible. That's what he taught me and that's what we used to say. Love Sam. Yeah. And that's where I learnt that um, skill to look after people so he had no problem with that. And then he was just bank them up behind you. He goes, yeah, Lisa won't be long. I'm thinking, oh my God, how am I going to cut faster? So, you know, there's a whole generation who take their time. They're artists. And that working for you? You just flick your eyes back. Uh, Really? Yeah. So people want a good service, but they want it in an incredible short amount of time. No one wants to spend three hours in a salon. Oh. If you could could do the same colour and take an hour and a half, I think it's worth twice the money. Okay. Just come back to all the thought around customer experience. So what you first of all, your tip Mm -hmm. was um, go and buy. Go and buy what you sell. Yep. Right? And do it often. Yep. Um, And do the same. Get people into your place and critique your team members too. Yes. So yeah, okay. easy. What's the front door experience like? Were you offered to rebook? Were you offered styling tips on how to manage your hair in between? Yep. You know, same as beauty treatments. You know, they do a beauty treatment and the next day they complain because they all ring up because they're red in the face. I go, well, why didn't you explain to them this is going to yeah, happen? Right. You could have pictures. So they don't think about what the customer doesn't know. They just, because they know it, they think everyone knows it. And they go, oh, bloody clients are ringing me up. So part of this customer experience, lease is the fact that you've got, everyone wanted the Lisa Sparkle, right? Uh, and then you've got all these other staff who don't have the Lisa. How do, you, how do you get people to buy into what you do? Do you just lead by example? Well, you teach them. You've got to make time to work on your team. And, and people want to train their people in skill as in technical skill. That's only part of it. That's I, given. It's like that's learned. Well, I think you can learn that. But if you if you teach people to give a shit and care, then they will do the skill properly. You know, and I was an average hairdresser. I was an exceptional hairdresser. I was an, an amazing people person. Mm-hmm. That's what won me all the points. Mm-hmm. And that's what you have to teach people. So you do teach them to that. You know, that's just what you do. Expect that you're going to teach someone. So if you find good people, you can teach them the skill. Right? Okay. But what they do is they chase skill and then they expect to, to teach someone to be a good person. That's ne- I've never seen that work yet. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I, I had great success with finding good people who want a great boss. 
and I was a great boss. When I left the country salon to go to the city and I thought, well, no one's going to know who I am, so how am I going to find staff? Whereas in the country it was easy because people go, work there if you're serious, you know, if you want a good place to work, that's, but you'll take no shit, right? So that was fine. So every one of them wrote down all the reasons why you should work for me and I was blown away that the single thing that came back was, she'll call you on your bullshit. It's a great place to work. There's no bitchiness. Yep. Treats us all equal, everyone, from apprentice to the senior. And that's what they loved about me. When at times I thought, oh, I'm being a bit harsh here. But, you know, we had a magic door. When you walked into the door, it was called a shit shaver. If you've got a bad attitude, I'd just grab you by the shoulders and go, come back here, love. I'd go, zh, 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 zh. there you shave a bit of shit off you. <laughs> now come in, see, it made you laugh. Uh... So there's a nice way of saying to people, you know, this is an island. So when you come into work, all your troubles get left behind. Isn't that a good place to be? So it doesn't matter what's going down in your life, come and work here where it's a great place to work. Mm -hmm. And if you start to talk about things, you just put your hand up. Done. Tell it to the hand. Don't tell it at all. Don't tell it at all. And if we were going to say anything negative, I had to take you out the front of the salon. So if, I was, if we even were going to talk about a client who was driving us insane, we weren't allowed to talk about it in the salon. You just say, come out the front. It feels to me like I, I, I can't help but agree with what you're saying, but... There will be business owners that you work with who have a highly, like, give you the most amazing haircuts ever, but you're telling them to pull their staff out and put their hand up and give them a shit shave and take them outside and, I mean, it just might not be part of their DNA. But I think if you're going to lead a team, isn't that what running a business is about? Yeah. Then you need to learn this. If you don't learn it, you're just going to chase your tail. The amount of salons we come across that got up to five or six on team and then ended up back to, to none again, why is that? Because there was no honesty in the business. There was no, this is how it's going to be, no culture, no core. So, therefore, it's going to fall over at any point. I imagine there'd be a lot. Uh, the hairdressing industry would be full of people who go and start working at a salon or as a friends. hair cutter. Or friends. But then they go, oh, I reckon I could do this myself. So, is this multiply effect of... Yeah, they do. And we don't have that much trouble in beauty. Beauty, you've got to cost, it costs a lot of money to, to open a, a proper heavy-duty beauty salon, you know, but hairdressing it doesn't cost much no. at all. But then I just think the customer experience has got to change where if you go to a, one salon there's only one or two people in there yeah. then you've really limited to your choices like I want to go to a salon where she's great she's great, he's fantastic, he's awesome she's great. And I've got choices. Yeah, right. You know, imagine going to get your coffee and they go, no, he's not here today, no coffee. Oh, shit. Mm. Right? So it's about, you have to be a leader. That's as simple okay. as that. And I don't care who you are, what business you're in, if you don't know how to lead a team and paint a picture of what's wonderful in the future and where we're going, especially this generation, they're very different. Mm. Don't get me started. I've got three of them. Well, I think they're fantastic. <laughs> how old are yours? Uh, they're uh, 17, 19 and 21. Yeah, mine are t twin boys, 26, and a daughter, 27. There you go. Yeah, so I, I, I've raised them to stick up for themselves. Yeah. Uh, I am talking to Lisa Conway. She's from Zing Zing Business Coaching, uh, hairdresser, it was ex-hairdresser, mm -hmm. country girl, made good. <laughs> Lisa, talk, let's talk, we have been talking marketing, everything we've been talking about has been marketing, but when you sit down with a salon owner and say, righto, what marketing are you doing, do they kind of glaze over? Uh, no, because they want to do marketing. That's where they say, oh, I just need more customers. <laughs> I want to market. And I go, oh, how long have you been in business? They go, eight years. I go, what did you do the ones you had? And they go, what do you mean? And I go, well, have a look. We've got, you know, 80 people come through the door every week. How many new ones? 20. And then you're still on 80. So clearly you're killing the same amount as you're, you're getting. Yeah. And they think, hmm. So uh, one of the things we make them do is you've got to look at the names of the people who didn't return. Four months we give them. If someone hasn't returned in four months, they're somewhere else. So before we teach you marketing, we can teach you some in-house ones, right? But before we teach you marketing, we want to tidy up your customer service and get everything right first because when you market, it's like shine the light on me. Look at me as a business. So if you market before you've got things tidied up, uh -huh. you're going to grow, you know, cancer grows too. Mm -hmm. So you've got to be careful about that. So some of them, we lose accounts because they just want marketing. I think, we'll go somewhere else, find just marketing. But we, we do the whole enchilada. That's what we do. So marketing, to me, I think they don't understand it. So they think it's like doing um, a doing letterbox. A yeah, letterbox drop, 
yep, something like that. Well, I think that's probably even moved on. Or they put things on Facebook and they put a post on Facebook and why, wonder why it doesn't work. And so I go, well, social media is not for that. It's about gathering a tribe and, and giving value back, so giving tips and how to look after your hair and, you know, what skin's like and all of those sort of things. So I don't think they understand it, for starters. Um, to me, the word marketing is just repeating your story again and again no matter where you go. And and people often say, oh, we just do word of mouth. Well, that just tells me you're lazy, you don't know how to do it. So you can do word of mouth on steroids by doing a referral card or things like that. So it makes sense to refer people who already know and love you and trust you. They know who to pick for you. So there's lots of things like that. But marketing, it's really fun. It's really Good fun. Bloody oath it is. I love it. But I think that you've got to understand it before you can start it. I, I don't think enough business owners... Um, see it as fun. I mean, their accountants oh, are telling them it. it's, it's like an expense. Fishing. Yeah, I know. It's amazing. It's like a net, you know. Ooh, got one. Yeah. Well, you, yeah, as long as you know how to what net to pull out. And, yeah, you know, and, you like don't, and you'll get the odd and, boot. You'll get yeah. the odd boot. That's fine. But I think, well, simple, I say to people, now, everyone who comes to your salon, they've got to go somewhere else. I want you to just ask everybody, do you like that restaurant or do you go to the yoga studio or where else do your customers hang out? And you could ask that just casually and find out and just keep a little list and then you go to those people. So if you're beauty only, go find a hairdressing salon near you and do a cross-pollination thing. You know, a florist, I even did it with a dry cleaner. Partnerships. Yep, 50 um, blow waves for free for his top 50 accounts. In they come. So people who have dry cleaning, they're a bit fussy. Yes. So they have their hair done. Yeah. It's not that hard. Not hard. That's no. a partnership strategy. That's right. Florist, you know, people who are spending over $100 in a florist for someone, they've got money. Yep. So they're the ones I want. So it's about finding those kind of people. I I, I, I loved it. And it wasn't until I got off See, the that's floor. that's fun. It's just a game, right? That's like a game. Right. It's a fishing like, who game. Who else has got my customers? Where, who roll else the dice, you might get two sixes. <laughs> Correct. You know? Who else has got my customers? Yeah. But you, what they do wrong is they come into your business and they go, can you put these, they're really sheepish, can you put these on your counter? And, the, you know, right. my hairdressers would say yes and I'd come and I'd go, who put this shit here? Yeah. And they go, oh, Susie, I didn't know what to say. I go, well, I turn them over. The first thing I'm really happy is if there's nothing on the back, they make really good notes for the grocery store. So I always say to people, when you do marketing, put something on both sides because yeah, right. that's what I used to do. So if you do that, then, you know, why would you do that? If I'm going to partner with you, I'm going to take you out for a coffee. I want to talk to you. First, I might send you a letter say, this is who I am. I wouldn't send a letter. I'd do a little video because that works for me. And you'd go, oh, who's this sticky nose? You'd have a look. And I'd say who I am and what I want to do. And I want to help you in your business. And maybe you can help me back in mine. And they go, hmm, oh, this, this chick's a bit different. So it's, not hard. it's not hard. It's fun. Yeah. But if you got your head down and your bum up cutting hair all day, where are you going to fit this in? So to, to that point, uh, do you then get your your clients to put aside a dedicated amount of time to yep. do their marketing? Half a, half a day a week. Love it. So you got to do. You got to find Love four it. hours. Yep. Phone off. TV off. Kids tied yeah. up somewhere. Four Probably hours a week. Tie them up. But well, like, yeah, you know. get them out somewhere. Yeah, you get, give them to grandma. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but if, you can find four hours a week uninterrupted. And I say even in those four hours, you've only got to find 45 minutes for each hour, right? But if you concentrate for 45, you can get a lot done, 45 lot done. minutes. Yep. But, you know, think about it. it. might be the first session might be to ring, you know, five of your people that you think you could synergise with. Easy. Or ten clients who haven't been back for four months. That's it. That'd be a gutsy thing because you don't want to hear, oh, I'm gone somewhere else. But hey, that's maybe business. That's a bit, well, you, know, you put your hand life. up to be a business owner. Hello. Yep. You know, it's it, the rewards are exceptional. So, mm. but you've got to put in. That's it. I remember the first time I sent out my first lot of um, uh, lost clients. So I'd gone back over twelve months or so, and I had these three hundred letters made, and I, I, I literally hung on to them in the postie box. I was scared to yeah, let them right. go because I thought everyone would think, "Oh God, she's desperate now." Yeah. And they just came in and just said, "Hi, oh, I haven't seen you for a while. We'd love to see you again." That's it, right? Not did we hurt you? Did we shit you? Yeah, None yeah. of that. Cut and they came off. in with these thirty dollars vouchers, and it was thirty dollars for a cut and colour. And they came in and said, "Oh, we've been thinking about you. Yeah, I thought I'd come in." So what it did was it gave them let them know that I'm happy for them to come back. It was not that. No one's lying awake thinking about your business. C- correct. At you, all. you are. The owner is, the owner's, right? The, no and one else thinking, is. Oh, everyone must be. It's not You at think all. about how Last many businesses you lie awake thinking about at night. <laughs> None. None. Unless there's some hot bloke at the, you know, good eye candy at the, <laughs> there you go. at the jump. But other than that, you're not. Correct. True. Correct. So get over yourself, dickhead. I yeah. say that all the time. Wow. Good advice, eh? Mm. Clients paying a few hundred bucks and you're yeah. like, mate, get, get over yourself, yourself dickhead. dickhead. 
There you go. Uh, I love your work, mate. I love the fact that you are helping business owners like selling owners who are really struggling with this stuff. Yeah, you, you, stressed, you, poor loves. You, you, they are stressed. And mm. hence, you Time know, poor. Yeah. Little fam- Most of my clients have little families. I hate that. You should be able to go and pick your kids up from school. There you know? must be... To tell, just to finish up, is there a moment you can reflect on? Because you must drop value bombs every time you get in front of a business. You know, you know so much more. You, you can see these people. You were there decades mm. ago, right? And then you drop mm. this little value bomb. Maybe there's tears sometimes where someone goes. Oh, on. we make them cry all the time. Yeah, we, I think you get a change out of. I just should say that nicely. We, you get a change out of emotion, right? So you've got to be excited. The only way you'll change is if you're angry or excited or happy, and you just you know or tears of joy, right? But if someone comes to me and they yeah, might have a crack at this coaching, no, I say you've got to be excited and nervous. Mm. It's a bit like when you find out you're pregnant, you think, oh, God, now I've got to get it out. Got it in. (laughs) That was exciting. Yeah, that was exciting, that bit. Now you think, oh, I've got to get it out. It's nine pound. So it's a bit like that. And I say to people, and especially now I coach the coaches, so we're getting coaches all across Australia now, and they'll say, I can't get through to this girl and I can't. I've tried to tell her and I say, what did she say? No, I can't. I said, well, make her cry. And they go, what do you mean? I go, make her cry. Get to the bottom of it. Yep. You know, and my coach made me cry not long ago and I just, he said, what's really going on? And he said it a few times, I wanted to punch him and I thought, well, you know, and then I came through with what was really going on, mm. you know, and he just said, good, now we know what we're working with. Thank Beautiful. you for being honest. And it's the same with them. I think especially our environment, we've got to put on this good face for everybody and and deep down they don't look after themselves and so therefore they're scared to have a crack in case it doesn't go. And so often they, they're very private and they don't want to say they're being coached and, and then they get a few months down the track and they start to see the numbers go up and, and then they start to do things at home. Like we've even helped um, people put rosters up for their teenage kids to cook a meal during the week. Hmm. Like, why are you doing everything? Who, yeah. who said you were a martyr? So basically we teach them business confidence, right? And when you're confident, you can do anything. You go home to your husband and you say, actually, I'm really struggling and I'd like you to help me with this. He's the first bloke who say, oh, great, I'll help you. But I didn't know. Mm. So, How many hairdressers does it take to screw in a light bulb, Lisa? <laughs> they can do it on their own <laughs> without a ladder. Your, your clients can. Oh, they're tough. But Google tells me too, one to change the light bulb and the other to say, wow, that looks fabulous, Gary. <laughs> I do like that. Thank you very much. <laughs>
membership rewards points. Plus, your new American Express Business Explorer credit card comes with up to 55 days interest-free and a competitive interest rate of 16.99% per annum. Now, I could go on about how it comes with complimentary travel insurance, two entries to the Amex Lounge at Sydney International Airport, or the fact that you can earn up to two points for every dollar you spend, but I reckon you get the point. <laughs> or should that be points? You've got to love it when your business expenses reward you. Search Amex Business to find out how. New American Express card members only. Offer ends 30 November. Terms and conditions apply. Ha! I did it again. Okay, my top three attention grabbers from my chat with ex-hairdresser, now coach to hairdressers, Lisa Conway, thanks to American Express and Design Crowd. Attention grabber number one. I loved Lisa's no-nonsense approach to business and marketing. It's simple. She calls a spade a spade and simply gets on with it. Attention grabber number two. The easiest way to find a niche is to identify what you truly love and build a business around it. We've spoken a lot about niching on this show. I think it is an incredible way to create a point of difference around your business and I'd encourage you to take another look at it and how you can apply a niching strategy in your business. Uh, and Lisa's advice around choosing something you love and making that the way you decide a niche, I think, is genius. And attention grabber number three, buy what you sell. Great advice from Lisa. You know, I often listen to other marketing and business podcasts to see how they go about it. it gives me a chance to see how high or how low, in some cases, the bar is and what I need to do to stay ahead of the game. Buy what you sell. Love to know what grabbed your attention. Head over to smallbusinessbigmarketing.com forward slash 386. Leave me a comment. What have you got to lose? All right, it is time for one simple yet effective marketing idea that you can implement immediately, one that won't cost you a fortune and that might just generate you more awareness, more inquiry, and ultimately more sales. I call today's idea the customer efficiency hack. Every time I fly to Sydney, I arrange for taxi driver Joe to pick me up. This is unusual on three counts. Number one, I prefer Uber over taxis. Two, there's plenty of taxis waiting already outside the arrivals lounge. And number three, Joe's the most expensive option. So why Joe? Well, I was reminded exactly why only yesterday. As we left Sydney Airport, Joe pointed out the banked up traffic on the freeway leading into town. It was bumper to bumper and would have turned a 30 minute trip into easily an hour plus. So instead of joining the queue... Joe calmly weaved his way through side streets and got me, stress-free, to my CBD hotel in the usual 30 minutes. The lesson? Intimately know the most efficient way to solve your client's problems. In a world where everyone is time poor, time is the new currency and people will pay you above the odds if you save them lots of it. So here's my three steps to ensuring your customers choose you every time. Step one, have an intimate understanding of your client's problems that your business can solve. Step two, map out how you can solve each one in the quickest, most pain-free way for them. And step three, provide your most efficient solution every time. And if you have client-facing staff, then make sure they do as well. And here's the pro tip, don't make a song and dance about it. Joe doesn't. He just does what he knows is best for my situation. As a result, I use him every time. <laughs> and no, you can't have his number. That's my three steps to being a ridiculously efficient business, ensuring customers choose you every time. Head over to smallbusinessbigmarketing.com forward slash 386 where you'll find a link to this post plus some additional resources to bring this idea to life, including six tips to help you understand your client better and five ways businesses can stop wasting customers' time. Plus, you can grab a personalised copy of my book, The Boomerang Effect. 
So, what have you got to lose? Well, that almost wraps up another episode of the Small Business Big Marketing Show, but don't worry. There's plenty of marketing gold coming your way in the weeks ahead, including a chat with Australia's most successful gluten-free ice cream maker. Must be tasteless, but anyway, it's (laughs) gluten-free. And the owner of Australia's biggest online store for toxin-free products. Thanks for all your feedback on my recent chat with barbecue chicken shop owner Wally Qualley, who just 10 months ago was in tears, having all but decided to close his fledgling business. Yeah, tears... um... I had to borrow some money off my uh, sister a few times um, to pay a few bills and stuff, which is hard, you know, even like you've done so well in the past and stuff and then one shop just brings you down. But I I was so determined to just turn it around, you know, like I had to do something. Well, he certainly did do something. He made one inspired marketing decision that changed everything. You'll find that full interview plus hundreds more over at smallbusinessbigmarketing.com or you can subscribe free on your favourite podcast catcher, including Spotify. Hey, I'd love to hear from you. Hit the contact button over at smallbusinessbigmarketing.com where you can email me, connect with me on social media and grab a signed copy of my book, The Boomerang Effect. Be sure to check out the American Express Business Explorer card if you love the idea of your business expenses rewarding you. Search Amex Business. And check out Design Crowd, the world's number one custom design marketplace where, with access to 550,000 designers, you'll get the perfect design every time. And you can get 100 bucks off at designcrowd.com forward slash Timbo. If you love the small business big marketing show, then let another business owner or five know about it by grabbing their phones and downloading it for them. Like grab their phone, open up the podcast app, search small business big marketing, hit subscribe, hand phone back, say you're welcome and run away. I'd love you to do that. Until next week, I'm Timbo Reid. Thanks for tuning in. May your marketing be the best marketing. Bye for now.